we'll see you later. All right, perfect. Uh, all right, so uh, again, I'm Nick Johnson. Uh, title of this talk is Acetabular Fixation of Primary Total Hip. What is the gold standard? So a little bit of outline. First, we're going to talk about the history of total hip and with focus on submitted acetabular, or, uh, you know, fixation of acetabulum. We'll talk a little bit about principles of acetabular fixation. Then we'll talk about submitted acetabular fixation, submitless acetabular fixation, and then talk about outcomes. So again, background, total hip arthroplasty is the gold standard of treatment of OA. Um, you know, we're why the number of primary revisions is, is expected to increase by 137% by 2030. With this increase, obviously, implant selection is key as, uh, you know, that'll drive kind of outcomes. As that's uh, loosening um, is still a major cause in the registry data as, as a cause for revision. So trends in fixation of both the acetabulum and femur have shifted towards cementless constructs worldwide. Um, fixation methods are largely based on, you know, area of training, um, with cemented total hips still being the predominant uh, mode of fixation in many countries, including the UK and, and Scandinavian countries. Cemented total hips, though, are, are essentially obsolete in the US, although there is an increased rise in hybrid fixation with uh, cemented femoral stems and pressed acetabular components. So a little bit about the history. Um, so initial designs in 1960s by Charnley involved fixation of the acetabular and femoral component with polymethyl methacrylate. Charnley prosthesis dominated, um, but surgeons had to do a, basically a fellowship, a two month fellowship in the UK in order to um, be able to order these Charnley parts and, and kind of you know, utilize them. So was, there's was long waiting lists and it was extremely difficult to, to get over there for US surgeons. Um, so it's difficult to implement here in the US. In the meantime, um, there was major cause concern, cause of concern for um, use of cement and total hip arthroplasty. A lot of kind of uh, acetabular lysis and, and where it was thought to be as a, as a cause of cement disease. Um, so in the 1970s, we shifted towards kind of more cementless fixation or at least tried to, tried to kind of increase the, the uh, longevity of the cementless uh, components. So in 1972, also the FDA declared that bone cement was a drug and they restricted it to the use by only investigators who applied for use uh, from the FDA, um, which further limited the use. Um, also during this time, uh, these smaller implant companies who were primarily focused on you know, bracing and, and traction um, who got into kind of total hip implants were purchased by larger um, companies and, and they got more sophisticated. Uh, manufacturing and then the design of implants, uh, you know, became more sophisticated. So uh, fast forward to kind of late 1970s, early 1980s, cement disease was actually found to be more particle disease re related to wear and osteolysis of the polyethylene cups. Um, UK and much of Europe continued to focus on cemented techniques um, and kind of poor early results uh, in cemented total hips, especially in younger patients in the U.S., trended us towards more um, cementless fixation. So why talk about this? Obviously, total hip's a, a great procedure and, and you know, it's kind of the gold standard. It, you know, was named kind of procedure of the year um, or procedure of the century um, several years ago. So wh why do we even talk about this? Um, these are, this is a recent review article on current trends of revision total hip. Um, they talked about the indications and the type of components were revised. These are the top three um, causes of revision um, in this. It was a probe lab or database review, dislocation, prosthetic joint infection, and loosening were, were the main three causes. Revision for loosening has increased um, since 2010, um, and both component revision has increased, although isolated acetabular components have decreased since then. So we'll talk a little bit about principles of acetabular fixation. So there's kind of three phases of acetabular fixation. Primary fixation, um, which happens in the OR, the acetabular cup is held primarily by either a mechanical press fit um, plus or minus screws or grout um, in cemented cases. Then you get intermediate fixation, which only applies to cementless constructs where there's slight post-op micro motion um, and migration that allows bony in growth and on growth um, leading to a stable implant. And then you get secondary uh, fixation where you get uh, the interface between implant and bone or the cement and the bone remodels as necessary to keep the implant fixed. So we'll talk a little bit about cemented fixation. Um, it's mainly for historical purposes. Uh, this was obviously introduced by Charlie in the 1960s. Cement acts as a grout for the polyethylene cup. Um, it relies on stable fixation at the bone cement interface to minimize micro motion. It requires optimal mechanical interlock obtained through adequate pressurization across the implant, the cement, and the bone interface. So a little bit about kind of pros and cons. Um, 
you know, obviously it's good for use in osteoporotic tumor patients, rheumatoid patients. You're able to place the cup in uh, cement relative to relatively independent to the native acetabular morphology. That is good and bad because you have to really focus on cup positioning and, and it's hard to kind of dial in your, your cup version and, and inclination um, you know, during cementing. It's bone preserving. It does show excellent long-term results, um, especially the registry data. Um, and then you have the potential for cement and cement revision. Um, cons, it's definitely longer. Um, there's a chance that you, you know, patients sustain bone cement implantation syndrome. There are concerns over durability in younger patients, and it's extremely technically challenging. So a little about kind of bone cement implantation syndrome. Um, this was a recent review um, out of one of the Nordic registries. 3,400 cemented procedures were included. This did include um, basically all cemented procedures, uh, which included shoulder arthroplasties, hip arthroplasties, and knee arthroplasties. They found a 0.1% incidence of severe BCIS with mortality in all four of those patients, and all four of those patients were undergoing cemented hip hemiarthroplasties. They found that there was an increased risk in patients greater than 75, those that were renally impaired, and those who had an ASA class 3 of 4. And then just kind of overall mortality comparison between cemented total hip and, and cementless total hip. This was a recent uh, review out of the same Nordic Arthroplasty Register. 108,500 totally cemented hips and 80,034 cementless total hips. Cumulative all day uh, or all cause 90 day mortality for cemented components was 0.41% and 0.26% for cementless total hips. They found that age, sex, or whatever they adjusted for age, sex, and Charleston comorbidity index. The adjusted hazard ratio was found to be no different in uh, mortality between uh, the two groups at 14 days, 30 days, and 90 days. So, you know, obviously this is a lot of it's a historical review, but, um, you know, assessing a cement and acetabular component. There's this radiographic demarcation that you can see between the bone cement interface um, on the immediate post-op x-ray, and that's strongly predictive of, of failure of a cement and acetabular cup, uh, you know, after doing a totally cemented total hip. Um, and, you know, this was another review that radiolucent lines on post-op x-ray, uh, you're 38 times more likely to be revised within 12 years. So, so a little bit on cement and acetabular fixation, the technique, kind of the onus for this talk initially was we were at AOS and, and me and Joseph were in an ICL where we, uh, went, it was on cemented femoral fixation and we were able to talk to one of the guys who was a, a surgeon and exer in the UK. And, um, he said that he does 100% cemented femoral stems and he does 50% cemented acetabular cups still. Um, and I, I didn't even realize that, you know, people were still doing that. So, you know, that was kind of the onus for this talk and, and researching a little bit more and just kind of comparing the data. So um, he was able to, I was able to talk to him and he shared a, a lot of these, this techniques. So I'm really thankful for him uh, showing me these. So um, uh, obviously, he's at the Exeter Hip Unit, which you know is is kind of the exemplar um, center in in the UK for total hip arthroplasty. Um, a lot a lot of their outcomes and and their utilization of of different constructs are are based on the data from the National Joint Registry, which is the UK's uh, joint registry. Um, his submitted acetabular algorithm. Um, he basically looks at preoperative X-rays, looks to make sure that there's no sclerosis, no cysts, or uncontained acetabular defects, which are all three contraindications for submitted uh, acetabular components in his practice. Um, he is 100% submitted on tumor patients, fracture patients, and rheumatoid patients. And then he said that patients greater than 70, he does an intraoperative assessment, um, going in with a plan for either submitted or cementless, and then determines. Um, kind of at the time of surgery, and then basically everyone over 80 that's getting a total hip um, ends up getting a fully submitted total hip. So he shared these videos with me. Um, they really have it down to a science. They they warm the you know the cement prior to surgery. Um, you know it's important in all uh, total hips, but especially important cemented uh, total hips to get really good circumferential acetabular exposure. This is a video. Hope it's planned that he sent me of just kind of the, the exposure they get. And then initial reaming, just like we do here, no difference. Really important to expose the cancel bone. You don't have to ream as deep. Um, you know, we're we're as much about getting press fit, obviously, but um, really important to expose the cancel bone to get good interdigitation of the cement. They, they leave in their last reamer to remove osteophytes, similar to you know, what we would do here. And then they selectively ream the sclerotic areas. As previously mentioned, obviously that's harmful to kind of cement interdigitation and can uh, weaken your construct. 
And this is where they get you know different. They use a two TPS burr kind of around zone one to create micro holes for kind of micro architecture for the cement inter interdigitation. And then they use this large 8 0 drill um, to create macro holes for cement interdigitation. Obviously, very important not to you know perforate the kind of medial acetabular wall. Um, as you'll end up with cement and pelvis, but um, then they use this vent in the super acetabular dome. He does not use this in people, you know, with osteoporotic bone where you have a chance of, of kind of breaking through. Um, but that goes in and then you hook that up to suction. Um, all the while, this is kind of a team effort. Uh, everyone's involved. Anesthesia does hypotensive anesthesia to control blood loss. Um, they're, you know, mixing the cement. On the femoral side, they even heat the, the stem so that the cementing, you know, happens quicker. Then they cut their flange and ass tablum to you know adjust it so that it fits. And then all the while they're doing pulse back um, constantly to ensure that they're getting all the particles out, which they think is the main you know um, way to decrease bone semen implantation syndrome. They do femoral head uh, autographed on the medial wall to kind of seal it. Um, this is a study that looked at this and sealing the acetabular notch and the cement and total hip um, in, 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 improved outcomes. And then again, wash and dry all the cancellous bone, ensuring it's extremely dry um, for good cement and interdigitation. And then they insert the cement. and insert the cup. And as you can see here, very technically challenging. And, you know, it, I think it's difficult to think about kind of getting your version correctly in this in this technique. Um, obviously, you know, you've got kind of one chance at it. And if you don't like it, there, there's no, really not much you can do. So that, that's what kind of has led a lot of countries in, in the US, especially from away from this technique. And then they pressure on the cup until cement is set. And then this is kind of the final look at what the acetabulum looks like after it's been fully cemented in. So he said it adds about five minutes to his case. They've got it down to, you know, the point where they, they've really got it down to a science and, and work well together. And, and it doesn't add a ton of time, but obviously high learning curve for this. So. All right, now we'll tr uh, transition and switch gears to cementless acetabular fixation. So again, introduced in the 1970s as an alternative to cementless fixation. Um, intraoperative cup stability plus or minus addition of sprues is kind of you know the gold standard. Um, introduction of porous acetabular components has led to long-term durable fixation. So the evolution of cementless fixation, previous limitations were the metal used, the polyethylene and the locking mechanisms. The solutions, now we use more porous metals. Um, there's also options for highly porous metals like specular metals and 3D printed, uh, especially for revisions in certain primaries. Ideal pore size is 50 to 30, 300 microns. Um, newly, you know, highly cross polyethylene, highly, highly cross-linked polyethylene is also uh, been a major, major evolution in cementless acetabular fixation. And then new locking mechanisms um, of the polyethylene into the acetabular cup um, limits backsided wear. So this was a study actually performed here in Charlotte, um, looked at backside wear and, and how the motion of the, uh, the polyethylene within the acetabular shell um, affects that. Um, so they looked at six samples of modular acetabular components from eight different, eight different manufacturers. The magnitude of motion varied between each manufacturer, but ranged from five to 311 microns. Um, and they basically concluded that the design feature should focus on better a uh, better seating mechanism to limit this micro motion. So then talk about fixation surfaces. Uh, this is a recent uh, comparative survival analysis of uncemented acetabular components out of Mayo. Um, it looked at all the kind of currently used acetabular components. They found that the best survival was in um, components that use fiber metal cups, rough and metal, and then trabecular metal. And then worst survival was uh, cups with large beaded surfaces and HA coated. So then, you know, there's a debate on screws versus no screws. There's, I haven't really been able to find any long-term study that showed any clinical difference between using acetabular screws or doing just press fit with no screws. I think there used to be a lot of theoretical concern about backsided wear and kind of in, increasing the relative uh, joint space with, with holes whenever we're using older poly. Uh, but with new highly cross-linked polyethylene, I think that's less of a concern. Um, 
retrieval studies have shown best bony end growth around the screws. Uh, Long-term studies show excellent results with both. Um, you know, in general, kind of line-to-line -line reaming plus, plus multiple screws is what's used by most most people here. Um, and a lot of that's, you know, based on a, a paper Keith Faring did that looked at cup stability. Um, they, they took six surgeons and basically had them put a, a press fit cup in and, and grade how stable it was. And it, they basically showed it's extremely difficult to, to grade stability just basically intraoperatively. So the addition of screws, um, you know, although it's it adds some time, um, is only a benefit. So then about kind of assessing in growth of a cementless cup. You know, there's this kind of classic article about, article about radiographic signs of ingrowth. Um, obviously, the absence of radiolucent lines and absence of migration on um, sequen sequential x-rays, a superior lateral buttress, uh, medial bone stress shielding, radial trabeculi, and then this inferior medial buttress are all signs of, of a well ingrown cup. Um, so what about uh, kind of the fate of zone two lucencies if you aren't able to fully seat the cut, cup? This was another um, study out of, out of Charlotte where 343 hip arthroplasties were performed. Um, and they looked at uh, patients who had cups fully seated and, and who were not fully seated. <coughs> mean follow-up was 9.2 years. 133 of these patients had incomplete seating of their cup on their initial radiographs. 94% um, of these patients who had a complete seating had evidence of complete zone two filling on final follow-up. So these zone two lucencies don't really affect long-term outcomes. So now we'll shift gears, talk a little bit about outcomes of submitted total hips. Again, obviously we're not ever going to go back to submitted total hips. I just thought it was kind of interesting to look at how they do it, you know, in, in different countries and um, look at the registry data. So this was a study out of Exeter um, using the contemporary flange submitted as tabular component. Back in 2016, this was kind of the modern version of all poly cemented acetabular component. They followed patients for a mean of 12 years. Um, they had 97.8% all cause survival ship, ship at final follow up with 100% um, survival of the cup for aseptic leucine. So, obviously, we showed kind of the results in Exeter. Um, a lot of people question whether or not these can be reproduced out of Exeter. Um, this was a study, it's still in the UK, so, you know, not sure if it's journalizable worldwide, but um, they looked at 664,761 primary total hips between 2003 and 2017 using the NJR um, database. They compared the kind of exemplar unit, which, which was Exeter in this study, to the more average performing units. And they found that actually implant selection, which included, you know, a fully cemented stem and cup, uh, was most predictive of revision rate and survival. Um, and it wasn't the hospital unit um, that, that performed the procedure. And then there's also a concern about cemented cups in, in young patients. So this was a study that they looked at patients under 40 who had fully cemented stems and cups and, uh, put in. Mean age at the time of surgery was 31 with mean follow-up of 13.6 years um, with a range of 10 to 20 years. All cemented acetabular com components, as I previously said, they had a 92.1% all-cause survivorship, all survivorship and 100% survivorship for loosening at 17 years. But again, there is a higher learning curve, you know, especially in this, and, and it's just, you know, more difficult adds time. Um, this was a recent study out of the Australian registry that looked at um, cemented acetabular components that reviewed over 20,000 people between 2003 and 2016. They stratified the cohort by age and then also by surgeon volume. Um, they looked at surgeon volume by the people who perform less than 10 cemented total hips a year between 10 and 25 and then greater than 25. Um, they basically found a protective benefit of totally submitted um, hip against revision um, when surgeons performed about 10 cases a year um, on patients over 65. But to get to that same benefit um, in patients that were less than 65, surgeons had to perform greater um, than 25 cases a year. Now we'll talk about outcomes of cementless fixation. Um, this was a study back in 2009 um, that looked at, uh, you know, kind of the more uh, modern uh, acetabular components, 124 hips with a minimum follow-up of 20 years. They found 92% acetabular survivorship in total. Um, five patients were revised due to aseptic loosening, um, but the main you know, cause of, of uh, loosening was poly, whereas they were still using um, conventional polyethylene. So this was a, another recent study that looked at the use of highly cross-linked polyethylene and modern um, cementless technique. Um, in patients under 50, um, they looked at 96 total hips um, between 1999 and then 2005. Mean follow-up was 17 years. 
um, mean age of surgery was 42 years, and they found that no hips were revised for loosening. Um, and then, you know, kind of a multi-center study uh, between here and some centers in, in Canada, 148 total hips utilizing contemporary cementless shell and highly cross-linked poly, five-year follow-up. They found a 97.1% all-cause survival and 100% survival for loosening. And then, you know, we discussed a little bit about surfaces. Uh, this was a study out of the Australian Registry looking at the use of highly porous acetabular components in primary total hip. They analyzed pairs of 20,000 uh, hips, and again, only 0.1% revision rate for acetabular components. And they even looked at specific components, and, and they found extremely low um, revision rates, although there was one outlier um, that, you know, has kind of been shown in the literature would be um, a little bit increased risk of, of loosening, but uh, other than that, great survivorship. So now we'll look at comparative studies and registry data. Um, you know, this was a recent study in 2013 and only looked at studies up to 2011. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, of bias here. There's, you know, it was unclear what the bearing surfaces were. Most of these were looking at um, conventional polyethylene. They looked at 26,576 primary total hits. 13,500 were cemented, 13,600 were cement lists. There was an odds ratio of 1.57 for survival of cemented acetabulum um, in this study. Um, there was an odds ratio of 0.54 um, for revision for any reason for the, uncement, or for the cemented cups. Um, but when you adjusted for age and sex, uh, there was no difference in odds ratio between survival of cemented or cementless fixation. Um, and then this was a recent study out of the UK looking at whether or not to use uh, press fit or cemented cups and uh, along with kind of the you know, gold standard femoral um, cemented stem. They looked at 1,086 total hips using the same cemented stem. 630 were cemented acetabulums, 454 were uncemented. Cumulative incidence for revision 18 years was 12.1% for cemented acetabular cups versus 5.2% for cement lists. Um, they found a significant implant survival benefit for cementless fixation, especially in those patients less than 70. And then this is kind of the state of, of where we are in the world as far as cemented versus cementless total hips. So this was a registry study reviewing Australia, Denmark, England, Finland, and the Netherlands, also New Zealand, Romania, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland from 2010 to 2017. Uh, they found that there was increasing use of uncemented fixation in Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, which are, are kind of you know, historically more totally cemented um, countries. Um, they found a decreased use of uncemented fixation in uh, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Finland. This is a graph representing on the left. That's all, co all comers, um, you know, the proportion of cemented fixation. So as you can see um, up top, uh, Australia or Norway has kind of lowest use of cemented fixation. And then um, Sweden, you know, is, is almost 80% um, cemented total hips. And then on the right, this is, you know, in their elderly cohort, as you can see, obviously a lot more total hips are being put in fully cemented in, in the elderly patients. And then this was a revision comparison. Um, and basically they found that patients greater than 70 had a lower revision risk for cemented total hips compared to cementless um, in all registries uh, when you looked at age. The cemented total hips were found to have a lower revision risk in UK females in all age groups. Cement list was found to have lower revision risk in uh, the Denmark, the New Zealand, and the Finnish um, registries um, in males in all age groups. And then there was basically equivocal outcomes um, in the registries in young patients. So then finally, what about costs? Um, imp implant costs are obviously less in the all cemented acetabular components, mm -hmm. similar to putting in all polytibia. But I think the increase OR time likely negates the initial cost savings. Also, as we, you know, uh, transition more to outpatient surgery and, and surgery at, at outpatient surgery centers. Uh, cement is not really obviously conducive to outpatient surgery, which I think is going to be the main driver of cost uh, as we go forward here in the U.S. So where do we stand in 2021? I just reviewed the, you know, basically 2021 uh, reports from the Australian, the U.K. and the U.S. database. So um, this looked at the you know, most commonly used cementless cemented, and hybrid stems um, in the Australian registry. And as you can see here, um, you know, these are the stem and acetabular cup combos. Um, they're the most commonly used with their revision rates out to 15 years in, in this um, study. And as you can see, uh, it's pretty equivocal. The hybrid fixation was found to have the, the lowest risk of revision, um, in, in at least this database. 
And then this is the NJR database, which is the UK database, um, looking at cement list, cement and hybrid. Um, as you can see, again, hybrid kind of performs the best in the, the um, long-term uh, registry databases, which leads us to believe that, you know, probably femoral fixation might be a little bit more important. And then this is the AJRR, um, which is the US registry. Um, so um, these are the most commonly used stems, and these are the survival rates. We only go out to seven years, it's, you know, it started in 2012. Uh, but as you can see, extremely low uh, risk for revision in, in these totally cementless uh, asset or totally cementless total hips. So at the end of the day, you know, one size fits all. I think we found with, especially with cementing, you know, more femoral stems now because the registry databases are saying that, you know, there's a lot more benefit to survival in, in a lot of patients um, whenever we do cemented stems, especially elderly patients. I don't think that one size fits all. I think, you know, if you're doing a total hip on someone like Bo Jackson, obviously this is what you're going to be using. I think there is some consideration that when this patient rolls into your room office, this might be a good good choice. So in conclusion, um, cemented, cementless, and hybrid total hips have great survivorships in all RCTs that I reviewed and all registry data. Um, there's moderate, moderate support for use of cemented fixation in patients greater than 70. Um, if proper techniques are utilized based on registry data from the UK and from Scandinavia, although these are you know difficult to extrapolate as we just don't have training in, in cement and acetabular components anymore. The new generation of cementless acetabular cups will likely outperform all previous fixation methods as we get further out um, in their use. The one size fits all approach has been proven ineffective, and I think every patient should you know be considered and, and um, their care should be tailored to to their needs um, and it's just you know imperative to constantly reevaluate what we do to ensure we're giving patients the best chance at outcome so i'd really like to thank dr jonathan howe he you know, really helped me with the videos and talking about cemented um, total hips dr Farring, dr masonis dr springer and then chris petrie thank you nick um, we'll ask we have time for maybe just a couple Brief question, yeah, yeah, uh, sir. just from in the interest of time, but yes, sir. Uh, great job. Just a quick um, first comment. Um, Churchill's described um, the U.S. and Brits as two people separated by a common language. Yes, sir. And, and here you go. Um, so just a quick question. Um, what's the relative size of the AJRR, you know, which obviously has run out of Charlotte here, yeah. um, versus the NJR? I know they've been at it for a long time. And then a quick technical question. Um, why does it make sense if you take all these measures to create a, a stable bony platform for cement, then you throw a bunch of loose bone graft in there? Yeah. So no, there's data on it, but it seems silly to me. Yes, sir. If you no, want a stable platform, why are you putting rocks in the in the cup? Yeah. Uh, you're so to get... First question, um, the size of the database here. I, I think it involves about 12% of all procedures here is my understanding. I had I actually had difficulty finding the exact number um, of kind of participation. In the UK, it's about 98% uh, you know, surgeons and centers participate in it. I think, I don't know if someone online or, or would hey, have Nick. a better idea. Or, 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 hey, Nick, you know, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Hey, sorry, it's Brian Springer. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but it's a great, great presentation, something that uh you know thinks if you think cemented femoral stems is a lost art cemented acetabulins are like buried in the tomb of tutankhamun or something like that <laughs> you know, it's just no one's ever gonna no one's ever gonna know but uh t just to answer your question as far as size so <clears throat> it, there's two ways to look at it from a capture rate right now the the american joint replacement registry captures about 42 percent of all total joints that are done in the u.s <clears throat> which is about cumulatively roughly about two and a half million procedures, um, which from a procedural perspective is the largest database in the world. Um, but of course, if you look at our European registries, you know, they're getting 98, 99% capture rate because number one, they have a, for the most part, a single payer healthcare system and they have a mandate, neither of which we have here in the US. So volume wise very big capture wise not quite where we would want it yet um these the uh i agree with you about putting the uh what's the point of putting bone graft in the acetabulum if you're not getting any biologic fixation it's all just mechanical i think the predominant reason they do it is because they ream through the medial wall to try and get a little bit more medialization of the set of a cup and then they just put the bone graft in there to, to prevent the cement from 
really extravasating uh, through the medial wall onto the through the membrane onto the iliacus muscle. So it doesn't really provide any biologic support. I think it's more of just acting as a as a barrier. And then the the last comment I was going to make, and maybe Josh could comment on this. You know, Nick probably. The one lingering area where cemented acetabular cups, aside from infection, which is a different animal, where they're still used was traditionally in the irradiated pelvis. You know, so people that had metastatic disease or primary bone cancer that needed a total hip. But even with the more now with the advent of these um, highly, as you nicely elucidated, these highly porous metal shells, I think the data on those has even overtaken the use of, of cemented acetabulums in irradiated pelvises. So Josh, I don't know if you want to comment if you ever, if you ever did that or use those routinely. Yeah. You know, so my experience as a resident, which is probably similar to most of yours was having cemented zero acetabulums. And so when I got into practice, I had a couple of cases as you referenced where I needed to do that. So a little anxiety provoking to be cementing your first acetabulum in these disaster revisions. So, um, with the advent of the, of the different um, ingrowth metal surfaces, I have actually used that several times. I've not had any loosening problems, really ugly, bad ones. I've actually sent over to some of you guys to go ahead and do the uh, acetabular revisions, and I believe all those were done with, um, you know, regular metal, uh, tantalum, whatever, you know, cup people liked. Um, so I, I would agree that... Um, it's more in my skill set to use the uh, alternative metal as opposed to cementing one these days. Only time we really cement them consistently is when we have a huge acetabular periastabular defect that we're curating out and have to, uh, you know, provide some sort of backfilling. Yes, sir. Well, since I trained in the tomb of two <laughs> I think I still cement in a cup. It, it really is technically demanding. There's a lot of that's around there's a lot of very important technical so you agree with things. five minutes extra time five is a joke <laughs> it's 15 minutes and you get, you know, clearing the cement you have to hold pressurization on for long periods of time and you've got to hold that position perfectly and, and the reason it went away is, is because the registry data early on said the femurs are doing great the cups are loosening at 10 years you know, those people come in and say it only lasts 10 years. Well, that's because the cemented S-Tabler components were failing. And so there's a necessary change at that point in time. And you look at some of your comparative studies that you quoted, those were on first-generation cementless acetabular components that had a lot of deficiencies that were fit corrected through the years. And that's why that, that bias in some of those long-term registry data that makes cemented acetabular fixation and cementless somewhat equal are, are very flawed. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, you know, I thought you did a great, a great talk with that. The femoral side at Exeter has been spectacular for 40 years, and, and you can't argue with their their cemented fixation data. Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks, Nick. We found you to uh, find any any procedure in orthopedics with equivalent outcome. 